if you have a Bible, um, you can find this helpful to follow in your own Bible, but we're going to have the words on the screen here so you can follow there as well. We're in a series in the book of Exodus. So today we're at Exodus chapter 19, uh, verses 1 through 8. So just a smaller section today. Um, We have been in this uh, sermon series since 1988, um, but we are slowly making our way through the book of Exodus. No, we, it's been a while, but uh, thank you for staying with us. As uh, What we've been doing is seeing how God takes his people Israel out of slavery in Egypt and brings them into a freedom, even though they are right now wandering, not really wandering, as God leads them in the desert wilderness. So out of Egypt, across the Red Sea in miraculous fashion, and now down in what we call the Sinai Peninsula, they've come to the mountain of God, um, Mount Sinai. Um, and this is where Moses first heard God speak to him through the burning bush. This is where God is going to, in the next chapter, uh, give them the commandments. And so this is a a key place where God has dealt with his people. They've just arrived there uh, where we pick up today, but God has something else that he wants to say to them first, and that's what we'll read about today. So um, as I read this, follow along, but remember, this is God's word. On the first day of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. And after they had set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. And then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And so Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him to speak. And the people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. And so Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we pause to pray. It's our um, recognition, our admission, our confession uh, that we are um, needy. We need you. We need your Holy Spirit right now. Thank you that you are present in this place. But we need your Spirit, Father, to uh, move, to overcome our blindness, our inability to really hear. Um, You can do all of that. You are so good to do that. Would you speak to us? Because if we can hear from you, God, we know it would change us. We want to be changed for your glory. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many, how many here today um, have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Okay. It's always nice to have a few Christians in the house when you're about to <laughs> preach, right? If you don't, that's okay. We're not trying to single you out. We, we want you to know, of course, that's what, that's what we really are about. Uh, we want you to come to know Christ. We, we use this phrase, relationship with God, relationship with Jesus. Um, and I, I want to unpack that a little bit today because I think that phrase can not have the correct meaning attached to it for a lot of people. Um, And there's a key word that's going to help us out of our text today, what we read, just a few verses, but there's one key word um, that I want to really look at and attach to this idea. What does it mean to really be relating to this God, be in a relationship with this God that I can't see, but is very real? How can I relate to him? And so this word that's a key word is covenant. Did you catch that in our reading? God says to his people, this is verses 4 and 5, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. So covenant here is the the word we want to, and some of you may be familiar with it. I would just say if you've read your Bible at all, 
you can't read very far before you are going to hit covenant. Um, not just the word itself, but even, my goodness, even the way your Bible is organized. I don't know if you realize this, but your Bible is kind of split into two primary sections. The first section we call the Old Testament, and the other section we call the New Testament. But testament is actually just another word for the, our word today, covenant. The old covenant and the new covenant. And Jesus, and you just kind of got reminded of this because you just took communion if you did. Jesus says, I make a new covenant with you in my blood. So covenant is, is everywhere. In fact, here's the truth. If you are in a relationship with God, you can't be in relationship except to be in a covenant. Covenant is the way in which God relates to people, to human beings. Covenant is essential to understanding not only how that functions, but it also tells us a lot about who this God is that we're trying to deal with and relate to. So covenant, if, if I were to give you kind of a, a starting understanding and description of that word, I, I would define it along these lines. Think a binding promise. Uh, it's stronger than a promise because it has a lot of implications to it, but it is a binding contractual promise kind of promise that you make and that is enforced and kept um, because there are consequences if you break a covenant Um, and in the Bible and and, and this goes beyond the Bible as well you you will see that covenant you can find basically two kinds of covenant one's called an unconditional covenant the other one is more of a conditional covenant and and conditional covenants by the way you and I you function with these all the time You you probably, if you didn't do it today, you probably will still later today. You certainly did it within the last week. You had a covenant every time you took your card out and you swiped it. And if they made you sign it, it just kind of reinforced this truth. If you took cash out and you paid for a product or services from someone, you actually entered into what would have been known in ancient uh, times as a covenant. The covenant in this conditional sense was if I give you money, you give me something in return. So if I go to the gas station, you know, and I swipe my card, or I, I give them cash, I say, now you got to give me gasoline for my car. And if I were to go and get the gasoline and not pay for it, I've broken a covenant there. I've broken a contract, and in fact, there'll be consequences for doing that. Of course, if I swipe my card and I get no gas, I will rain down consequences on, you know, whatever's wrong, what's happening here, because we made a contract, we made a covenant, it's binding, I gave you cash, money, I give you something, and you give me something in return. So that's covenant in a more legal sense. In fact, that is the kind of the legal issue of covenants, is that if you break the covenant, there's a a consequence to that. So we, we have those kinds of covenants all the time. And in fact, in ancient Israel, it was a uh, ancient Mideast, actually. It was very common. Um, now, when we do a covenant our way, we usually do pen and paper, right? Here, sign this receipt. Here, sign this. Because by signing this, if you sign for a car, if you sign for a house, you know, I, I'm, I'm making a covenant with the bank that I'm going to pay them, but I, get to, I have this house. I get to live in this house. And so you sign it off. But in ancient times, they didn't really use pen and paper. They didn't have those sorts of resources. But what they did have was a a lot of animals. And so they would actually make covenants, and this sounds really weird and kind of freaks people out, but this is the way they did it. They would take animals, and they would kill the animal, and they would cut it in two, in two parts. They would take half of the animal and put it on one side here, take the other half and put it on the other side here. And they would do a number of animals and kind of line them up so you have kind of this aisle, be kind of a bloody aisle if you think about it. You got gut and blood and guts and all over thing. They're all kind of flowing in between here. And then the two people who are making a covenant, a contract, a legal, obedient type of covenant would walk down together this uh, bloody aisle between these animal pieces. You can actually read about this in the Bible in Genesis 15. Um, uh, Abraham is going to make a covenant. God's going to make a covenant with Abraham. And he has him arrange things in this same way. He'd be like, yeah, that's what guys do all the time. And the idea was this. If you are walking down in between these split animals who, di- animals who have died, you're saying to the person, I promise to keep my end of the covenant. And if I break my end of the covenant, may I become like these animals. Like, Wow. 
you know, I just wanted to make a promise I'd show up the other day or something. And you're, you're making this a pretty dramatic thing. This was, this was important. This was their way of saying, may I become like this? May I be killed? May I die if I don't keep up my end of the covenant? That's a legal binding covenant that has to do with obedience to set rules or regulations, things that you are told, you must do this. But there were also other kinds of covenants. We call these unconditional kinds of covenants. Covenants of love. So if the first kind of covenant is kind of a covenant of law, here's the rules, you've got to follow them, you've got to do them. The other covenant of love is not one where it says, you do something for me and then I will do something for you. But in fact, it's, it's this beautiful expression that says, look, I'm going to commit, promise, vow myself to you regardless of what happens. Now, our, our best example of this in our day and age is the marriage vows. Marriage vows are not the legal kind of covenant, but they are a covenant, but it's a covenant that's saying, look, whether you're sick or whether you're healthy, I will be there. I, I commit myself, I vow, you know, don't get me started on this, I always get a tangent on this. You know how I hate wedding vows that aren't really wedding vows where they two get up and they're, oh, I love you. You complete me. Uh, you are so amazing to me. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not a vow. That's, that's you're telling us that you really like each other. And we already get that. That's why we're all here dressed in these crazy outfits and stuff. And wait, I get all that. Tell me, give me something that says, no matter what happens, I will be there. So when they say in sickness and in health, I'm faithful. In fact, we would find it really, really odd if you switch those covenants out. And you still made it a covenant, but you made it conditional. In sickness or in health, I will be faithful to you unless you don't put the toilet seat down, right? You know, if you add the proviso. Because if it says, you've got to do that if I'm going to be faithful, right? Oh, I will be completely faithful no matter what happens unless you don't give me the remote control and have control of that. Then, then the deal's off. If we, if we heard couples do that, we'd be like, that's crazy. Because that's supposed to be a covenant of love, Right? So on the one hand, you've got two kinds of covenants. Now here's the problem. When God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you, wh which of those two come to mind for you? See, because which one of those first pops into your mind begins to define, oh, so, so my relationship with God is like this. Some of you, maybe, I don't know, your background, your past, or the where you're at right now in your life, the first covenant that comes to mind in relationship with God is the legal one. Hey, hey, God gives me rules, and then I, I keep the rules, and the agreement is if I can keep the rules well enough, that God will, will love me, that God will be good to me, that God will keep bad stuff from happening to me, that God will save me, and, but it's con conditional. I, I've got to I've got to work really, really hard at making sure that I don't mess up my end of the covenant. And I just want to tell you that if you are in that mode where your relationship with God is primarily a covenant that is a legal covenant, the real danger of that, of course, is that your life, oh, it breaks my heart because your life is filled with fear. I mean, when you think of God, you don't think joy, happiness. You think fear because you're you, you realize this. I, I, don't keep, I, I don't keep all the rules. I, I do this to you guys all the time. How many of you sinned this past week? And everybody raises their hand. It's like, yeah, yeah, every single week we recognize every one of us, me too, my hand's up first. I blew it again. I, I sinned again. And, and when you realize that and you're like, so if my relationship is primarily a, a legal law covenant, I'm doomed. I mean, no wonder the fear begins to overwhelm us. And at some point, I think it, destroys us or destroys anything coming close to a real relationship with God. And so there's a real danger there that we actually just despair. But there's actually a danger, maybe, maybe your first thought wasn't, no, it's not the legal one, Cliff. I, don't, I really don't think of God that way. I, the loved one, that, that one, that's the one I think of right away. And that, that's good, but here's the thing. If that's your only view of God, like if your covenant with God is, is just primarily this idea of love, and here our culture defines love in, in lots of different ways, many times very differently than what the Bible does, but our culture kind of has an idea that, hey, God is love. 
you tell me that Jesus died on this cross and he, you know, he, he forgave my sins and we come in and we say, I sinned again this week, but it's all taken care of. And the danger of this, of course, is that God becomes kind of this uh, grandparent, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm a grandparent with my grandkids and I know they're not perfect now. They came and visited, so we had this extended time where they're, they're, not, they're not perfect. And yet there's still a part of me that's going, but that's my kid's problem, not my problem. They've got to work with that, not me. And I'm going to be the, the one who, oh, they love to be around me because I don't correct them or discipline them, but we sure have a good time. And that's kind of the picture that some people can get of God. Well, he, he forgives, doesn't he? I hear you preach that. Absolutely. Well, then you guys are making such a big fuss about when we do sin because isn't it all taken care of? And the danger here is not despair. You know what the danger here is? complacency. The danger here is to say, well, I guess it really doesn't matter then if I obey or disobey. Jesus has got it covered. And complacency will kill a relationship just as much as despair will. Think about that. Even in human relationships, you know this to be true. Complacency will destroy any relationship when you say, it doesn't really matter what I do. Hey, they gave me their vow. I'm, I don't really have to worry about what I do. That relationship is going to die. As much as fear will kill it, complacency will kill it. Now, here's the thing today that I want to just kind of highlight. God does this amazing thing. When the Bible talks about the covenant-making God, what it really says is God does what seems almost impossible. It is by human standards, but God takes both a legal sense of a conditional covenant and he takes the loving sense of an unconditional covenant and he brings them together. So when we think of relationship with God, it's not either or, it's both and. But I have to unpack that because as soon as you say, oh, so it does depend on me. No, 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 don't go there. We are not under the law. We're not, this is not about trying to win your salvation by being good enough. But God does bring together obedience See, when you hear the word obedience, that, that makes us a little, uh, I like the idea of a loving God, but it makes me a little nervous when you hear obedience. In fact, and I'm not trying to, and maybe this is a, a phrase you've used, don't, don't, don't jump on this too quick, but just, I hear a lot of people nowadays, and some of our, our younger people who have been burned by church, like, like church has, has really scarred them. And, and again, we repent. I mean, we just, uh, there's no excuses for us as a church or any church to help people you know, or kind of bring this kind of pain in somebody's life where they're like, man, I, I wanted to get involved in a church and it just brutalized me. And, and we've, we repent of that. But a lot of people coming out of that have kind of drifted into a thinking that says, look, I'm no longer a religious person. I'm spiritual. I'm spiritual, but not religious. And that sounds fine. I think what they're saying is I don't really want to get too involved in the, in the kind of traditional church. I don't want to get involved with a, a structural church that has boundaries and all that stuff. I just want to be spiritual. I just want to be relationship between me and God because he's loving and I don't want any of that mess. I, I get that where that's coming from, but I would tell you that if your spiritual but not religious relationship with God does not include a tough word, obedience, then you don't really know the covenant-making God. Jesus puts this together in one phrase. This is in the Gospel of John. He says, anyone who loves me will obey my commands. You hear that? Jesus is bringing love and obedience together in a way that seems incomprehensible to us because on the one hand we think, if I am in obedient mode, it's not about love. If I'm in love mode, it's not about obedience. And Jesus is saying, no, it's, it's brought together in me, Jesus says, in me. It's not you bringing it together, but God brings it together in a covenant. And now, if you're observing here, and this is good to challenge, challenge that pastor up there. Hey, don't let him get away with this. In our text, did you read? It sounds, Cliff, I don't know, it sounds pretty conditional to me because I read God say, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then you will be my treasured possession. So hey, that makes it sound like it is all about obedience, and it's up to me, and I'm back into the grind of fear. Can I pull this off? And I want to tell you that's not at all what he's saying. Here's my case for this. When is he saying, 
if you do this, if you obey me, then you'll become my treasured possession. It's after, not before, it's after God has already shown them how much he already loves them and accepts them. It's after he brought them out of Egypt, not before. Imagine if God had said to the people while they were in slavery in Egypt, if you obey everything I command you, I will bring you out on, on eagle's wings. I will carry you to myself. If you can be obedient, then I will do that. He doesn't say that. He carries them out by grace. He pulls them out of that slavery, and by grace he gives them freedom, and he says, now that you know that I love you, now that you know that I've accepted you, because all that language, oh, it's a beautiful picture. On oh, eagle's wings, I carried you out to myself. I want you with me. And I've done everything to make that happen. Now I call you to obedience, but it's not an obedience out of fear. It's an obedience, the scriptures call, call this obedience of faith. Obedience because you already know you're loved. How can then he say you're loved if he's really saying you're already loved, but I'm looking at you to be, not yet, but you will to be my treasured possession. Maybe there's one way to think about it. We were, it's like two months ago, we had the citywide garage sale thing, you know, everybody, we, we did that. We had some items that we were selling, old, just junk to me, it was junk. Old stuff, including this old dresser. It was, it was kind of a cool looking dresser in the sense that one, you know, years ago, it must have looked really nice. It had this kind of weird front to it, really nice looking. But, but the thing itself was just in, in, in just tatters. We used to use it. <laughs> We used to put the cat stuff on top of the box or this, this dresser because our, we had a dog and to keep the dog away from the cat stuff, cat food up there. So it had cat vomit on it and it had hairballs and it scratches and all the, the varnish was off of it. It was just a wreck. It was just a piece of junk. Sell it at the garage sale. You never know. Sure enough, here comes a lady. And she says, this was her actual word. She says, I love it. Like, I don't know what kind of vision this guy's got, but I, are you sure you're looking at the same thing I'm looking at? Because this thing is nasty. It's falling apart. It looks horrible. And she is saying, with a vision, she's saying, absolutely, I love it. Because I know, and you know this to be true, she actually sees what it's going to become. She says, oh, I know it doesn't look like much now, but after a lot of work, a lot of buffing, a lot of hard work, this thing is going to become a treasure. Isn't that it? How can God love us when he knows that we are messed up? How can God already say, and then say, and then I'm going to make you to become my possession, my treasured possession? You're saying you don't love us yet? No, I love it. I love you. But I'm going to make you into someone who reflects the glory of God. I'm going to make you to reflect the glory of my son, Jesus Christ. And so God looks at us and he says, oh, if you obey, do you see now obedience is not for our salvation, but is for our transformation? That you don't obey now to try to get God to accept you, but because God has accepted you by grace unconditionally, now obedience becomes this essential part of becoming a treasured possession. I used to think, that obedience was <clears throat> like for God's sake. Like, I think this will make God's day if I can just be obedient in this area, and he'll be happy. I don't know why he has these rules. I don't know why these commandments. It's just for him. It's not. God's basically saying, these are for you. Do you realize that this is actually for your benefit, your transformation into becoming a treasured possession? And so Jesus says, if you love me, if a love relationship is in place, it automatically attaches to it obedience because the obedience sees who God is making you to become. And he doesn't make you become that just by waving a wand over your head. He does it through obedience. He says your obedience is really going to bring your greatest joy. So this is our covenant-making God. By the way, Paul puts this together. Let me read this verse real quick. First Corinthians 9, the Apostle Paul is talking about how to reach people with this truth of the gospel. How do we spread the gospel? And he says, well, depending on who the person is, I approach it different ways. But here's how he puts it, 1 Corinthians 9. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Hey, wait, we're, we're not under the law, right? And Paul says, though I myself am not under the law. You're right. Christians, you're not under the law anymore. 
Oh, good. Well, I'm glad we got that straight, Paul. And then he goes on. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though, now here's the one that usually catches us, I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. I'm not free from the call to obedience just because Jesus died on the cross. So what he's doing is he's attacking these two things, complacency and the sense of utter despair. He's attacking both of those, and he's saying because the obedience that comes when you know that you're already loved and the obedience is essential to your becoming who God wants you to be, he brings these two together. Now, a couple of quick things to note about that. The first thing I would note is this. The people's response to this, did you catch their response, which is just classic. People all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. Now, when you hear that, you know, you're like, wow, you know, that's a great statement. But I want to notice uh, the first thing that this really means, the implication for this, is they really aren't saying we're going to do all of these list of commands because God actually hasn't given them any yet. You notice that? I mean, doesn't this sound like, don't you dread this when this happens every once in a while? Somebody comes to you and they say, Hey, are you free on Friday? And they're not telling you what, you know, because inside I'm going, oh, man. They're going to ask me to move these sleeper sofas from the first floor to the third floor, and they got five of them, and we're going to spend all day Friday doing that. And so you're afraid, right? You're kind of hedging your bet. You're afraid to just say, I'm not doing anything on Friday. I'm completely free. And, and you, you realize in that moment, they're not asking me the specifics. They're really asking me about them. And then when you say, I'm not doing anything on Friday, I, I'm completely free, I'm yours. And then they say, great, because I want to take you together. We'll go down to Hobby Lobby, and we are going to spend the day at Hobby Lobby. I'm going to pack some lunches. I'm going to pack some water bottles, our hiking boots, and we are going to spend all day in Hobby Lobby. And you're like, oh, man, I wish I could, but i got to move some sleeper sofas for a guy I know <laughs> over here. And, you're like, oh, what did I get myself into? But you know what happens? When you love the person, you are committed to the person. And you're not worried about the specific command. You're like, I'll do it because it's you. And the first thing about a covenant then, when God is talking about obedience, you're like, oh gosh, I'm going to have to tell God I'll be willing to do anything. But the first thing he says, what you're really committing to is not a list of rules, you're committing to me. Because if you love the person, you will do things that you don't really want to do, but you do it because of the relationship of love. And that means we will have full effort, full effort to obey without despairing when we sin. Obey me fully. And the people said, we will do everything. You know, I mean, you're, you're shaking your head, I'm shaking my head. God was shaking his head, really? They're going to do every. This sounds a lot like when your kids come to you and they gang up on you on these things and they catch you and they're like, we want a puppy. We want a puppy dog. And, you know, mom and dad, oh, gosh, we don't want a dog in the house. And we sit them down and then you start telling your kids the terms of the covenant, right? You're like, here, here's what it is. A puppy is a big responsibility. Yeah, we know that. We know that. But, but do you understand? You're going to have to, you're going to have to potty train this puppy, and every day, you are going to have to feed and water this puppy. And every day, you're going to have to make sure you take it for a walk. And you lay out all the terms of the covenant. Do you understand? This is, and they say, we will obey everything the Papa has said. We will do everything that you've said. We will, and you're saying to yourself, you know, you already know. There is no way that they are going to do all of this stuff. You already know it. God already knows it. And so my, my question is, I'd be surprised here to think that God would just say, okay. But he does. He accepts it. He receives it. And I'm thinking, shouldn't the people have said, we will obey everything that we can. We, we will try our best. We're not perfect, so we're not going to get it right. That would be a response that God would say, no, nope, that's not what I'm looking for. But God, you know we won't you know we won't move, do this completely perfectly. And yet God wants in that moment them to commit 100%. Yes, I will do everything. Here's a truth for you. Too many times we come into relationship with God and we basically say, God, 
I've got a mess in this area of my life, and definitely I see I need you. But we got these other areas, God, you don't have to worry about that. I, I got that under control. You, you don't need to monkey with that. You don't need to mess with that. And God is saying, no, I, I need you to say you will do everything. Even though I know you can't and you won't, I need you to say it. Why? Well, actually, for a parent, we get it. We want our kids to say, yes, we will do all of that for the puppy. We really will. Why? Why do we want them to say that? Well, one, when they say that, they understand something they wouldn't have understood before. And first is, they understand, you know what? All of these things that they just listed, the puppy really needs that to live and to survive and to, th and to thrive. Like they need food and water. They need all that stuff. And I wouldn't have really got that unless my dad forced me to say, yes, I understand that I will do that every single day because in that moment I become aware that my obedience actually impacts the lives of other people. See, when Jesus said, you want to sum all this up? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as you love yourself. He gives us three loves. Love for neighbor. He says, your obedience matters for other people. And even when you break obedience, when you sin, you recognize now in a way you didn't before, you are hurting other people. There are no private sins. There is no sin that you can commit in the privacy of your own mind even that doesn't in some way or another hurt people around you. And you become aware of that when God says, this is the term of the covenant, all in or not, everything or not. Okay, God, I'm all in. Here's something else your kids learn when they say, yes, we will do everything that you've said to take care of this little puppy dog. They recognize something about themselves, which is, and now this, don't get this twisted, but there are times afterwards they say, yes, we will do all that. When you see, they don't want to do it, but because they've made this grand statement, it's usually for the first week or two, but after that it doesn't work, but the first week or two they are reminded, hey, you made that promise, and they're like, yeah, yeah. And then they obey even when they don't feel like it. And actually, this is one of the reasons, this, I think it might be the only reason that parents throughout history allow their kids to have dogs is because they say, but there might be something good that comes from this. They will learn the discipline of obedience when they don't feel like it. And this is exactly why God says, yep, I want you to be all in on the obedience thing. Say that you will obey it all because you will recognize there are times your obedience has to be done even when you don't feel like it. I don't feel like praising God and you drag yourself here and you are worshiping and sometimes you get sparked by other people worshiping around you and realize God deserves my praise and I have nothing emotionally to kind of stir that up but God I give you my praise anyway. And that is precious worship by the way. You might not have your hands up. You might not have a glow on your face but it is precious worship when you say to God I know you deserve my uttermost feelings as well, but I don't have that, but I still give you praise. You are still good. And when you do that, you train yourself. It's love for yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Obedience reflects that. And lastly, it does this. When you, when you recall for that moment of total acceptance of the covenant, it actually reminds them, you know what, where I fail, it's a pretty good thing to have somebody pick up where I leave off because that puppy would be dead if mom and dad didn't actually show up when I didn't feed him and when I didn't water him. And in that moment, yeah, there's probably some guilt there. There's, oh, I should have done that. But thank goodness I've got mom and dad because that dog is strong and healthy because they showed up every single day and they were making sure that in my moment, they let me go as far as I did and when my obedience failed, boom, right in there. We say this a lot. Hey, did you guys have a good week this week, this past week, or a bad week? And, and you're like, ah, oh, it was a bad week. I gave in to temptation again. I struggled with that same sin over and over again. Did you know, I don't know how, however bad your week was, Jesus had another perfect week in you. We say Jesus is in you, right? You know, yeah, yeah, but I, but I failed. But do you realize that when it says that Jesus fulfills the law, when Jesus Christ is your righteousness, it's not just this kind of distant thing. It is every day where I fall short, where Jesus commands me. He doesn't give suggestions. Hey, you might want to think about this. He says, no, love your enemy. Command. Getting connected to my body, the body of Christ. My body, Jesus says, command. 
Forgive those who have hurt you. Pray for those who persecute you. Command, command, command. And we try and we fail and we fall short and we say, well, I guess what's the point? Why even bother? And Jesus says, because wherever you stopped, I'm going to pick up and I'm going to fulfill through you, in you, the righteousness that is supposed to happen. And so Jesus has another perfect week in you. And here's the beauty of it. He says, you know what? You only got this far. But all of your commitment got you to that point. And now that you see that I'm the one who's carrying you to become this new treasure, that you will see I'm the one who's carried the rest of that. I fulfill in you, through you, what you can't. And all that comes and only happens because you were willing to finally say, I'm all in. I'm not going to play church. I'm not going to mess around with spirituality or religion. I am all in, 100%. God, you have every area of my life, and I know that I will fail, and you know I will fail, but that is not going to stop me from full effort. Because that happens way too much, that Christians don't even try with obedience because they think, well, if I try, it means I'm trying to prove myself no, or why even try? Jesus already died for it. And somewhere in there, the covenant-making God says, no, it's absolutely crucial that you are all in so that you can say this. I am freed from trying to prove myself through my own success. But with every fiber of my being, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. When I fail, and I will fail, and I do fail, I am not paralyzed by shame or by guilt because I know that now, right now, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so I forget what is behind and I strain for what is ahead, pressing on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. There is not an inch in there of somebody saying, well, what's the big deal? Why try? No, Paul's saying, I am absolutely secure. I'm not under the law. God has saved me. He has loved me. He has accepted me. And now that's exactly why 100% effort in obedience, not to prove myself, to become a part of what God is doing because he fulfills all of it. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. Let's pray.